You know, when we think about history, it usually feels messy, right? Chaotic, completely unpredictable, just a jumble of names, dates, and events. But what if a huge chunk of it, especially from the medieval period, wasn't random at all? What if it was actually written to a script, following some kind of hidden algorithm? Okay, so let's dive right into the heart of this puzzle. On the left, you see a list of early U.S. presidents. It's the kind of random sequence of names we expect from real history. But now look at the right, a list of early Holy Roman emperors. There's an order there, a structure that feels, well, different. The source material we're looking at today argues this is absolutely not an accident. And it asks a really fascinating question. Why does so much of medieval history look less like random chance and more like a deliberate design? So how do we even begin to unlock this kind of mystery? Well, the source uses a method it calls structural analysis. The idea is pretty simple, actually. Instead of just reading a list of kings like a story, you treat it like a string of data. You look for repeating patterns or even patterns that grow in a predictable way. Kind of like a computer scientist hunting for patterns in lines of code. And believe me, when you apply this lens to medieval Europe, some truly astonishing things start to pop out. All right, so our first and maybe most detailed case study is the list of kings from the Holy Roman Empire. We're talking about the period from 911 all the way to 1313. And this is where the theory gets really, really specific. It basically argues that this entire line of succession is governed by something that you can only describe as an algorithm. Okay, so here's the core pattern that the analysis points to in that German king list. A reign starts with a Conrad, it's followed by a Heinrich. Then there's a list of kings with other names and the whole block closes out with another Heinrich. This pattern is said to repeat itself perfectly four times. And get this, it's not just repeating, it's a growing pattern. The list of other kings in the middle grows predictably. First it's three kings long, then four, then five, then six. I mean, that's practically a recursive definition. It's just way too neat for the bloody chaotic reality of how medieval succession actually worked. But wait, that name algorithm? That's just layer one. The second layer is all about time. The source points out that three major dynasties, the Saxons, the Salians, and the Stauffers, dominated this period. Each dynasty's rise to power was kicked off by a king named, you guessed it, Conrad. And the start dates for these major dynasties? They're separated by almost exactly 113 years. We're talking 911, then 2420, then 1137. It's, well, it's like clockwork. So, the key takeaway here, and this is really crucial, is that these aren't just a few isolated coincidences we're looking at. The whole theory rests on four different patterns. You've got the name algorithm, the 11 three-year cycles, those dynastic blocks, and hey, let's not forget the fact that the names Conrad and Heinrich only show up in this 400-year window. They're all layered on top of each other, all fitting together perfectly. I mean, the probability of that just happening by chance, it's gotta be staggeringly low. And this is where things get even weirder. Because this apparently isn't just some weird German thing. The source material claims that when you take this same kind of analysis and apply it across Europe, you start finding similar, just seemingly impossible patterns in one country after another. And next up is France. So check this out. For over 260 years in medieval France, the name of the queen seems to be almost locked to the name of her husband, the king. So if the king was named Philippe, his wife was almost always named Bertha, Maria, or Johanna. But if the king was named Ludwig, his wife was almost always named Blanche, Adelheid, or Margareta. I mean, think about it. There's no real historical, political, or family reason for this. It's just there in the data. And on this point, the original author is incredibly direct. He basically states flat out that a connection like this is, and I'm paraphrasing the German you see on screen, impossible in reality. Think about it. Marriages back then were all about power and alliances, not coordinating first names. So to find a statistical link this strong over centuries, well, it's presented as evidence of a constructed story, not real life. And as if that weren't strange enough, the source points to another detail from France that just seems a little too perfect. This unbroken chain of 328 years where the crown passed peacefully from father to eldest son, every single time. Now, in an age of plagues, assassinations, and just brutal wars over who gets the throne, this kind of perfect, uninterrupted succession 
it starts to feel less like history and more like, I don't know, an idealized fairy tale. Okay, let's hop over to England. Here, we find a totally different kind of pattern, but one that's just as bizarrely mathematical. If you look at the list of English kings and you just kind of set aside the Norman dynasty for a second, a really simple rule pops out. From the year 899 to 1461, every seventh king was named Edward. Not around the seventh, but precisely every seventh. All right, so as we go even further afield, the analysis starts to identify what it calls a key construction number, a number that seems to pop up again and again, especially when you look at the monarchies of Northern and Eastern Europe. The source claims this number acts almost like a blueprint for building a national history right from scratch, and that number is 27. And this is where that number 27 really starts to cascade across the map. The analysis claims that the foundational histories of Hungary, Denmark, and Scotland are all built around a list of, you guessed it, exactly 27 rulers. And with just a few minor exceptions, which the source explains away, the exact same 27 ruler system is supposedly found in Poland and Norway too. That's five different kingdoms, all apparently built to the same numerical plan. But you know, all of this, as strange as it all is, it almost feels like a warm-up act, a prelude to the most ambitious, the most sweeping structure the source claims to have found. We're talking about a pattern that spans over 1,100 years of history in one of the world's greatest empires, the Byzantine Empire. The theory here is, honestly, it's breathtaking in its simplicity. It argues that the entire list of Byzantine emperors, from Constantine I, way back in 324, all the way to Constantine XI in 1453, is a perfectly symmetrical structure. So it's framed by 19 emperors at the very beginning and 19 emperors at the very end. And what's in the middle? Three distinct blocks, each one containing exactly 10 emperors. A simple, elegant formula. 19 plus 30 plus 19. But the pattern isn't just in the number of emperors. It's also in the timeline itself. This is incredible. The source claims that the total reign of all the emperors in each of those three central blocks adds up to the exact same amount of time. 139 years. Not close, but identical. We're talking three different sets of rulers spanning more than 400 years of history, all neatly packaged into identical time capsules. At this point, the source's conclusion feels pretty much unavoidable. The author writes that this time-based structure, laid on top of the name-based structure, can, and again, I'm paraphrasing the German on the screen here, only be explained if history is following an ideal concept, a deliberate construction. The claim is crystal clear. This isn't history as it actually happened. This is history as it was written. So, let's just pause for a second. If we accept the premise of this analysis, even for a moment, that these massive stretches of our accepted history were deliberately built with these hidden mathematical and story-like patterns, well, it begs one enormous unanswered question. Now, the source material doesn't give us a clear answer for who might have done this or even why. It really just focuses on demonstrating that these patterns exist. And so we're left with the theory's most central and most provocative implication. If our official history is really some kind of elaborate construct, a story written to a script, then what real history, what other story does it hide? And what does it mean if the very foundations of our past aren't what we've always been told they are?